Today's episode is brought to you by Silencer Central. Now, if you haven't used a suppressor slash silencer, they're the same thing. If you haven't used them hunting, you need to. I recently did this and I am on board fully. Before Silencer became one of our, Central became one of our sponsors, I was on a hunt, a couple of hunts where they were using them. Here's the advantage, follow up shots. Not only do you get that one surprise shot, you also get a second one because that animal isn't scared of the noise. They may have felt the impact, but they didn't hear the noise. Check them out. It is unreal. They are building the silencers specific for hunters, lightweight, short silencers that you can put on any gun. I had an amazing conversation with Brandon Maddox, who is the CEO founder of Silencer Central. Check that episode out as well as check silencercentral.com and t- let them know that Ike sent you and get set up today. I appreciate sitting down with me, Glenn. I, we we have, uh, like just a few minutes ago, before I hit record, we just had a, a awesome little conversation about um, about Eberly Stock and what you guys are doing new, and you yeah. guys got some new stuff coming, Yeah, and uh, you've taken some really good adventures this last year, last 12 months, some awesome adventures. We got on a, yeah. a cool deer hunt that was fun, Yeah, and um, so one of the, the our, my podcast is a little bit different. It's all about... Um, genuine conversations that, that guys that the audience can get entrenched in and you know there's a lot of people that go I've heard Glenn is really neat I've heard he's got some really <laughs> cool stories and some really cool history and where did the Everly Stock brand come from you know we're sitting in your showroom here in Boise Idaho and the first time I came here this was a gutted it was here but it wasn't there wasn't anything in it yeah you know 15 years ago and yeah. you've gone through adversity so but let's talk before we get into the Everly Stock brand, because that is obviously part of the Glenn Everly story, but it's sure. not its not the full story. Yeah. Um, did you grow up in Idaho? You, well, as a little kid, I was in Colorado, and my okay. dad moved to Idaho, a little town north of here, when I was 12 years old. So I, I grew up in a little mountain ski town, McCall. Okay. Uh, uh, Beautiful place. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then really, you know, so for my, my youth and adult life, Idaho has been home and, and it certainly feels uh, like home. Yeah. So, yeah. So you don't remember much of Colorado? No, I, I have a great memory of Do being you? a little kid. Now. I mean, it's roaring around. I, I, I had a hell raising cool childhood and I really have great <laughs> memories of it because I was lucky to live in a little tiny town in the mountains and, and have free run day and night of the place. So I it was raised in a kind of cool way that just turned me loose early on, which I think this, that, that, really was where the seeds of adventure were planted in me, you know, just the realization that I could go climb up these mountains or just some of the, like there was a place that we called the, uh, I think we called it the time tunnel, but, uh, about the size of these pipes overhead, there was a culvert that came out of the side of the mountain down below I 70 okay. and it came way down this fall and we'd go with flashlights and, and climb up into that thing. And, go, and the challenge was to go all the way up through the top and cross under I 70. There was like a water culvert in the middle and then you go to the other side and then you come back when you came back for the downhill run you turn on the flashlight and be sliding down the, the inside you're of this culvert, kidding me you know? yeah and just you know just stuff that where you're like well it could have didn't rain <laughs> yeah because we we did just crazy stuff like that you know you're like how did they how time. did they not put a grade on one end of that yeah, yeah stuff that could but, happen nowadays yeah 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 but so that's a sense of adventure going into the darkness not knowing what's in there yeah with, with a flashlight and you yep. know probably your brothers and sisters at toe and yeah for sure and, friends and sometimes by yourself i mean a few times you know when i was really getting bold i'd go by myself and yeah up there it was just kind of like yeah cool but the other wild ones were uh some of the old gold mines were still open i mean it probably still are you know but you could go walk you go walk back into the heart of a mountain in an oh old mine gosh. and that's listen to spooky. it creak and yeah but i did stuff like that and um, pure darkness yeah yeah and uh so in some ways you know it made me a brave young boy and yeah. uh but also just that spark of uh and thrill of the unknown and adventure, and you know that came on early on. And I, I started camping in the mountains when I was a, you know, single digit, you know, six, yeah. seven, eight year old, and yeah. and on from there. So well, and your dad was a he was a commercial airline pilot, yeah. right? So he was really busy. So there was a lot of this that you did just on your own. Yeah, and dad, you know, was a was a interesting, colorful, you mixed bag of a human being. Um, he was really cool in some ways and really indifferent in other ways. And so we had sort of this 
in retrospect, kind of balanced life where when he was gone, we were freewheeling and on our, you know, and then once in a while when he we was were home, feral. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your poor mother. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, she, would, she was all for it. She's like, yeah, you go have fun. Um, but then when he was home, there were, you know, there were times when it was, the brutal work came on and the, and the uh, things you didn't want to do, but the things that also in retrospect shaped you into a man, you know, so yeah. he was, it was pretty cool, really. And, and cool, the balance of those things that led me to grow into who I became. So. Well, in your work ethic, I've heard you tell stories um, about your dad's work ethic was unbelievable, and he instilled that in with you guys. You'd, you'd leave the house at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and drive all night <laughs> yeah. to work all the whole next day. <laughs> well, it was kind of like that. It was more, you know, he'd fiddle around the house until everybody was impatient to have gone a long time ago. And by the time he left, you didn't really want to go, but you, off you went, and then you, you know, you'd work that night into the dark, and then it was once it was dark, he'd be frittering around do it something else you'd be like gosh i'm kind of want to do dinner you know but <laughs> but anyway um but he was a, a good man and a, like you said a hard working man and he certainly um insisted that we do the same and yeah. share our part of the load so which again is good but when he was gone it was great because then it was like whoa <laughs> <Let's go laughs> play. Time. Get to do what yeah, i want to do we Crawl played hard and... yeah it was pretty fun so yeah. so you grew up Colorado, yep. uh, moved to McCall. Uh, how old were you when you guys moved up? Uh, Twelve. Okay. Yeah. So and, and just soon, about middle school age, junior yep, high. Yep. Soon after, started shooting guns and learning how learning what that was about. Really, with my dad early on. I think, uh, in fact, yeah. When I think think about it, we moved there when I was twelve, and there was a hunting culture in McCall. Um, and and dad had bought a ranch down in the Salmon River country, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, he had this old thirty forty Crag, which you guys have shot I th at the yes, ranch. We, yeah, we, we took did. that gun out. But that yeah. was that was my first gun, and he taught me. And, and man, hard kicking son of a gun oh, for man. a little a kid. Mule. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but he taught me how to shoot that thing. And then when I was fourteen, he took me deer hunting on the ranch one you know early fall morning, and first time with a you know high caliber rifle in my mm -hmm. hand going for game and i he taught me how to do it all and and uh, it was a peep sight gun and yeah. i remember walking across this meadow iron that it's, yeah iron sights yeah, but with a peep rear sight yep. in, a, in a post front right. and uh but really nice rifle for taking a beat on something and so that story was that first morning i'm walking across this meadow and i see these two mule deer skyline about 300 yards above me and I was like, oh, man, they're going uphill. And, and I knew, you know, 14-year-old kid, I knew that if I didn't take a shot then, I was never going to see him again. So right. I thought, I'm, well, I might as well. So I just in instinctively figured out, well, it's an up angle shot. So if I put my the, – the bead covered the deer. Right, because it's 300 the, yards. Yeah. I mean <laughs> – yeah. And so the bead covers the deer. And, and I'm like, well, I lift up some amount. And I'm like, that's about right. And pull the trigger. And that deer turns around and runs, and I'm like, oh, I must have missed him. So I, the other one's still standing there, so I do the same thing. I go beat on him, pull up a little bit, pull the trigger. He runs. I'm like, ah, oh, darn, I must have missed them both. So I go around the side oh, of the mountain. no. <laughs> you know where the start's oh, going. Yeah. This is a 13-year-old's <laughs> nightmare. <laughs> go around the side of the mountain. I'm looking for the tracks. I don't find the tracks. I'm like, what's going on? Climb up to the top of the mountain, and there's a deer lying there. I'm like, holy crap. I yell across the valley. My dad was across the valley. Yep. Climbing up the other side of the mountain with my, my kid brother. I go, Dad, I got one. And then, it, you know, as I'm trying to figure out what to do with this dead deer lying there, I'm like, wait a minute. You know, this is, I guess, my confession long after the to the Idaho <laughs> fishing game. But, uh, like they, they did the same thing. I, I did the same thing, and I realized, and uh, and I stand up, and I look down the hill, and the other one's lying in the fence down there. You oh, know? my so gosh. Both heart shots. You're kidding me. First two deer I shot, opening morning, iron sights, long range, heart shots. And that sort of set my standard, which I've since not always consistently met, you know, yeah. but, I, but I've, you know, it was, it was actually kind of cool because my brother had a tag and poor kid, he had to use his tag on my deer, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, you know, it was also just that, uh, uh, you know, realization that, wait a minute, you know, it connected a lot of things for me. I, um, realized that I had certain skills with a rifle that right. I wasn't even fully aware of, but if I could do that offhand, and accurately and you know and it just really kind of you were standing clicked. up when you pulled this trigger yeah offhand shots yeah, holy yeah, holding the rifle looking uphill and and really I, I can still remember crystalline memory of how steady it all was and how you know how cool my head was and oh my you know, gosh yeah, that is kinda, a huge confidence starter yeah exactly it really was for, for yeah. a lot of things in your life yeah. now 
wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's, I guess one reason why the story comes out is that it sort of, it cemented a lot of things for me. Yeah. And I failed in a lot of things since then. I mean, I, I've screwed up so many shots that I just look at it and I'm like, gosh, you know, I did that with a gun. <laughs> what? <laughs> but, but, you know, so it happens um, still cause, because, you know, which again is part of the lesson of it all too is, uh, you know, I in Alaska this past year I had remarkable shots on the sheep that I shot and I was right. really happy with it. It was a challenging cross canyon, hard left wind, yeah. diving, you know, mess of a air current thing. And I shot through that in a way that it was right, yeah. you know, and I, and, uh, first shot was a good hit and the second hot shot shot was an absolute kill. Cause I knew where the first one was a little fur, further up, a little further low than where I wanted it. So right. corrected and bam. And, and you, in your um, shooting suppressed. So you had the ability to take that second shot. Those sheep weren't on the other side of the mountain before, you know, you could right. set back up with yeah. a complex shot like that. Yeah. 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 And in truth, we were pretty far from them, so they didn't know where anything was. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, and they, they probably they didn't never go very shot far, at before. Yeah, no, yeah, and they they were in a remote place, and they so they didn't go far in any case. But but it was just cool, that, you know, again to apply things right. Now, contrast that with you know the couple of days later, me shooting at a caribou, and my excuse is that I was exhausted from it all, but I, and and a little wounded inside. Right. It turns out, but. Um, yeah, I just kind of casually was like, oh, I, you know, I'm really good at this. It's no big deal. So I, you know, dope the get the Kestrel out. I dope the <laughs> dope the wind and the range and dial the sights. And and uh, I'd had it set up for the the Kestrel was set up for the sheep at 584 yards, and the caribou was at 400 something yards. And my brain, instead of going, you know, to 400 something, went let's say 450, whatever it was, it went from the 584 setting in the Kestrel to 550 oh. instead of 450. Well, so, that makes a big difference, yep. it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> 700 yards. Yeah. It's a little different. So my first shot at that caribou was hit a rock above it, and I'm like, what? And uh, my <laughs> What brain, caliber were you shooting? Because it was uh, a Seekins, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, Seekins, 300 PRC, beautiful oh, rifle. Oh, my gosh. I mean, just an absolute nail driver to the point of, you know, you know, I have complete confidence in the gun. Mm -hmm. And again, this the reason I told that part of the story is it was a reminder that I also have complete fallibility as a human being. <laughs> and every once in a while I go, oh, geez, once again, I did something really stupid. And yeah. that was just, that was one of those moments where, unfortunately, I, you know, it's nice to have a clean miss if you miss. That's, right. that's the best scenario, especially if you can correct for it. And I eventually ended up killing that caribou, <laughs> but, but it was a, not, a as, great not, not as clean and pretty as, as the, you know, sheep was, or as it should have been. And which again, the point of my confessions is that, um, you know, everybody has those moments yeah. and it's good for us to share and learn from things like that. Cause yeah. you know, cause it's easy that, that, it, that thing actually, you know, it was part of the thing, you know, the, the fabric of my inner self is that I do things well generally, yeah. but also often without, you know, complete thought put into them, yeah. <laughs> you know, a little bit spontaneous in my, you know, some of my actions and a little bit creative, I guess, in some, you know, moments of life. And, and so, and so those things sometimes don't lead to good results when you just barrel into something. And, uh, and, and each time I do it, I'm like, gosh, you know, inner self, a little bit of talk about it. You can be better than that. You should be better than that, but you're still teaching your lessons at almost 60 years of age. So yeah, anyway, that happens. So, so you, um, grew up McCall and yep. one of the chapters, uh, of your, of your, of your life and your story is skiing yeah. and not just downhill skiing, which I'm sure you did a ton of that. Yep. I mean, McCall's a, a awesome ski town, but, um, yep. there's also, uh, the cross country um, yep. part. What? How did? How did you transition from? Because I'm sure every kid downhill skied in McCall. I'm sure that's what you guys did. That's yeah you know, in the winter. So all you did. How did you transition into into the biathlon? Well, the, the story really goes back to Colorado. I you know I remember being a little kid. My my dad taught me to ski when I was two years old. But I could alpine ski because he could point me downhill and you know <laughs> yeah. and and somebody was down below to catch me until I figured out how to turn and stop. Um, and I remember being some age probably three or four probably four and my dad was a cross-country skier and at that time there just weren't that many people that thought that was a cool sport but he right. was one of them that did and so he'd go out and you know blast around and i and i and you know all the stuff then with the wood skis the pine tar that you put on yeah. and then the, yeah. the different kinds of kick wax and it was just this mystery and i'd always look at it God, it's so cool and the smell of the pine tar as uh -huh. he's working on the skis and so 
um, I remember, you know, being with him one time at uh, Loveland Base in Colorado, and he was going out cross country skiing, and and he he goes to me, you know, you can't do this till you're five, and, uh, and you remember like, that I do, I remember oh exactly the moment, and and him telling me that I had, you know, that, had to be that, five, yeah, I had to be five, you know, because he was thinking that, you know, I had to have a little bit more cardiovascular, you know, heart yeah. or something. I don't even know what he was thinking. He was probably but, really thinking, I want a couple more years of doing this by myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, so Being I was. Father of so it's really fun. Because the truth is, growing up as a cross country skier as opposed to an alpine skier, which I, I did do both, and we yeah. I, we did when I moved to Idaho, we did it was called four way. We did you know two forms of uh, alpine skiing, the slalom and giant slalom races, and then ju- ski jumping and cross country skiing. So okay. it was, it, we did four way when we were little kids, and uh, and so I grew up on all kinds of skis. Um, but I but I remember that anticipation of cross country skiing you kind of set the hook in a, in a neat way because yeah. there were times when it's just misery when you're slogging along out there. And, um, in Colorado, when I was, you know, in that, in that five years and up range, there were two kids really that went to the Nordic races that were in my age group. So I always either got first place or second place. So I always got a medal, <laughs> not like they do now, like a participation medal. But I won, you know, it's the second place. I was first place. But <laughs> if there was, if there was three, I still would have got second. <laughs> yeah. But so I have a whole bunch of medals from being a little kid, in, you know, in the Aspen ski club or someplace that we went when I was in Colorado which was fun you know again those things were confidence builders mostly because you also actually had to go get around the course you know yeah. And, yeah. Um, and then when we moved to um, Colorado the the cross country thing really there started with uh, the fact, two things. The f- first is my body was outgrowing my muscles, so I was getting taller and lankier and skinnier, and I and I didn't have the muscular strength to to in that part of life to really you know connect with alpine skiing and the, right. You know, but with cross country, long and lean worked pretty well, and I had a really neat ski coach mentor um, who'd been a uh, two time Olympian on the U S team, but he was a Finnish guy by background and had the fin- Finland heritage. Okay. And, uh, his name was Mac Miller and, and old Mac, man, I, I look back at life and that those people that were, were the people, person that put, you know, God put in front of you yeah. for a reason, you know, yeah. and, and, and that made all the difference. And, and, and I can connect the dots from where we're sitting right now, all the way back to the gifts that some of those people gave me. And, and Mac was one of the first big ones. My dad was the first big one. And, and then mom for letting me run wild, you know, those were the good <laughs> ones. But then, but then Mac, you know, took me in underhand, saw that I had some talent and taught me how to be efficient on cross country skis. You know, he, he teach you to read the snow and find the little thing that if you stepped in front of it, it would slow you down. But if you step a little bit more on top of it, you get a lift and a little boost and, and you, and you maintain your energy and your flow. He basically taught me flow over the snow in a way that, um, you know, by the time I was uh, later an adult and on the U S biathlon team, one of the best compliments I ever got was I overheard, uh, one of the guys on the, from on the Norwegian national team, his name's Shell Sobak and he's one of the studs, you know, yeah. in the sport. And, and he said to, um, my Norwegian coach, uh, he said, Hey, you watch that Glenn Eberle. He skis like a Norwegian. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's so cool. But it was because, uh, you know, Mac had taught me efficiency and that carried forward. Because the truth is I was never the strongest guy and, and never, you know, trained probably as hard as I could have. I, I always thought that life included should include balance. So that it meant once in a while you smoked a cigarette or drank a beer, you know. <laughs> I worked so hard yesterday. I deserve this. Yeah. That was just that way. That was, you know, I was, I've never been a conventionally boxing person, but... Uh, but I was successful in ski racing, and it started with Mac, and then uh, and there was a guy from McCall that had been on the U.S. biathlon team in the '76 Olympics, and you know, in my high, when I was in high school, and he was right. sort of that, you know, childhood local hero, and that led me to biathlon. Going, that looks, you know, they're shooting guns. What's that all about? And uh, there was another fellow there that prelude to that hunting story I just told. Um, first started shooting with 22s to learn a biathlon in those first few years that I'd moved to Idaho, and so. Uh, the, the sport had just transitioned from large bore, you know, whatever they're shooting, seven six twos or something, right. to twenty uh, twos, uh, and so we started shooting twenty twos and trying to you know emulate this local hero, and uh, and I actually connected with biathlon in a way that was even different from cross country skiing. I was a good cross country ski racer, and had I pursued that, I'm sure I would have done great. But with biathlon, um, you know. 
I, you can stop and do something else every once in a while. And for my crazy ADD. personality, that kind of worked. You know, I right. could I could go ski race hard, but knowing that there was something else coming up, you anticipate a little bit differently than just a full ten kilometers around a course, which is a grind. Well, in biathlon you still bust your ass. I mean, you ski a 10 K about as fast in a biathlon race as you would if you weren't stopping and shooting. Right. So, uh, but that, that breakup and complete switch of mental gear, mental gear is a pretty cool thing. And so I, you know, I, I really related to that. And, and that I, makes it unique. Yeah. Oh gosh. It was such a fun sport, you know, because it did combine two things that are so uh, opposed to each other. And, uh, and so, um, and I was good at it. I got good at it early on, uh, went to the junior nationals for every year. They'd have one biathlon race at the junior nationals almost as a demo, but it was really a scouting thing from the, for the U S team to oh. look for the upcoming talent. Mm -hmm. So I got spotted when I was a kid and they, they encouraged me to, you know, shoot for the U S team. And by the time I was 17 years old, I was on the U S biathlon team wow. and uh, went on from there. So Roll back. I didn't realize. I thought they always shot the twenty-two. I didn't realize yeah. that they shot big bore. Yeah, it was big that. bore uh, up until somewhere in the late seventies. Do you know why they changed? Well, it's a, it's easier to set up a small bore range and a big bore range is the biggest thing. You know, it's it's uh, and then also you know all the nonsense of reloading, and yeah. <laughs> trying to figure out the the loads and the guns. It was cool. You know that uh, uh, the sport was supported around the world by militaries who, you know, uh, like the Finns were very good at it because the Finns had fought the Russians on snow and beat them, you know, right, and, yeah. and, and, and so the, in the North Scandinavian countries, biathlon racing was actually, um, some of the earliest form of ski racing because there were these soldiers that, you know, that trained in the wintertime on skis and they'd, and they'd raced, uh, uh, you know, checkpoint to checkpoint. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and so racing and sh skiing and shooting w was, prelude to ski racing in some ways hmm. it's kind of interesting most people don't know that i didn't but, so yeah you would think it came ski racing yeah shooting. somewhere along the way they decided to throw that in but it was actually then. yeah mm -hmm. and and so they, they grew up alongside each other but when people ask about where'd that come from well, actually look it, it was one of the first olympic sports in the winter olympics because it had prehistory there so it's kind of cool it's like every it's like a lot of our sports come from just pe guys or people doing it and going hey yeah. i bet i can beat you throwing spears yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. getting on a horse yeah. and letting it try and buck you off or right. whatever right 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 yeah, yeah. that's yeah. interesting yeah so then uh you got 17 you were on the the u.s olympic yep. team or, or, or the, the national, national team. team yep and so i went to the the uh world championships when i was um 17 and 18 uh then went off to college and in, while well, I was in college, uh, the 84 Olympic trials came up and I was, nobody thought I was going to make it. I was 19 years old and, mm -hmm. and, you know, there were all these big guns in front of me that were the, you know, elite U S racers. And, right. but I was hungry and, and had that just perfect confluence of skill and passion at that time. And kind of the upcoming, like I can do this attitude inside of me and, uh, unexpectedly to anybody else except for me <laughs> and one coach who thought I could do it. Um, made the U.S. Olympic team in 1984, wow. and uh, making it was a big deal because nobody thought I could. Um, and then, in the, over the course of that season, I really cemented myself as one of the top four guys on the team. So that puts you into the relay team, uh, puts you into the prime races at the Olympics, and all the all the World Cup races and things that go along with them. So that was really a big year that for me. Awesome. It was kind of cool. That was sort of the year I was like, okay, I kind of made this. You know, that was '84. Uh -huh. How yeah. old were you? Nineteen. Nineteen. Wow. Yeah. So wow. at that time, I was the youngest U.S. Uh, Olympian in the, in the sport of biathlon, that, the youngest guy that had ever made that team. And that was and, the Olympics after the Russian Olympics, right? Is that the the one with the with the hockey? Was that eighty? Oh, oh, you're, you, what do you, you with mean? the the hockey team that played the, the U.S. hockey yeah. team that played the Russian? Yeah, that was yeah, that was nineteen eighty. The nineteen eighty. Yeah, so, so it was the Olympics was, after that, which yeah, then everybody was yeah. watching everything. Yeah, it was a yeah yeah. The U.S. sports kind of got a big lift from the, the miracle winter. on ice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and then it was interesting also because it was the, those games were held in Yugoslavia, so mm -hmm. it was just a, it was cool to go behind the Iron Curtain and kind of the whole weird thing that was going on in our world back then. So I'll bet yeah. I'll bet that was crazy. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Did you guys spend? Because you you know, and people know I'm sure people know this now, but you just don't go over there and 
go, okay, we're going to race next week. You're spending time over there, right? Before yeah. Before yep. and during. We'd, we did, we'd basically do a tour of Europe each winter um, where you'd go to all the World Cup races that, that led up to either the Olympics in the case of 84 or the World Championships in all those other years. Mm -hmm. And so for seven years, I, I did that tour um, with the highlight being the Olympics or World Championships. And then later, um, you know, somewhere along the way, being on the U.S. biathlon team, um, I'd been being recruited by guys to try to join, to get me to join the military. They wanted, they wanted me to join the Army, as, as a lot of my peers had, because the uh, military has a world championship competition that they call SISM, uh, and the Winter Games are, are basically a mirror of the Winter Olympics, but with guys from the militaries all around the world that meet up. So, mil so countries compete against countries, mm -hmm. but they're yeah. military. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a military oh, competition. It was I didn't know that. It's a sporting competition, which is kind of cool. And, and so the U.S., uh, mostly through the National Guard, had this presence there, and they were always looking for guys to make their teams better. And so they were always asking me if I'd join. I'm like, hell no, I'm not joining the Army. <laughs> <laughs> but so, somewhere along the way, somebody said, hey, you know, uh, the uh, Idaho Guard has F-4s. You could probably become a fighter pilot if you join the uh, Air Guard. And I was like, what? <laughs> wait, wait, <laughs> that's I, a completely different story. <laughs> <laughs> I could do, I could do what? <laughs> and so that just that was another one of those moments in life where, you know, the, a switch got flipped in me that it was like, holy cow, because it was just after Top Gun had come out. Oh, yeah. I was like, and I came back to Boise, and I saw these fighters going up, you know, initial, like, and, and pitching out, and I'm like, I, I could fly one of those things. What, you know, it's just this really like no way. And Cause they still have a very active, uh, air force. Oh uh, yeah. Training. Yeah. Here, right? A 10s out here now, which I actually flew the first a 10 into Boise in later, later years along the way. Um, was one of the first instructors to go to the, the conversion from the F four to the a 10. That's awesome. Um, but the, uh, yeah. So when I was still on the biathlon team and I was, flirting with this idea of getting in the air force i went out to the guard base out here and they had a simulator and i get in the simulator in the f4 and there's a guy whispering in my ear telling me how to fly it but it was just like this overwhelming crazy experience i was like whoa what are and, all these you know, how do I'm, i do this i'm going mach one i'm going you know 800 miles an hour what you know and of course then you crash it and but you know yeah. that was part of the part of the but it was just really cool and then um I got selected to become a pilot through another story, which was kind of funny. Actually, what, what I did is uh, that's one of my favorite stories. Oh, you were going to be a cook, weren't you? Yeah, man. So <laughs> somebody's like, you know, it's really hard to get a pilot slot, but you know, if you show them you're committed to it, you know, that's the best way. And I, this and is I, this is a lesson for, for for our audience. This is a lesson: is persistence, persistence, and not and, taking not taking no for an answer. Right, and and self belief. Because the funny thing was, I was like, well. They sent two guys a year to pilot training, and everybody wanted to do it because it was right. the best deal. I mean, a lot of guys in the Air Force find out what the guys that are coming from the Guard were doing. They're like, what? I never heard about that. Yeah. Because <laughs> you get to fly more, you know. And, right. and, and uh, I mean, as a pilot, it was a really neat thing because we did deploy and went to war and did cool stuff. But but as, on a day-to-day -day basis, you knew that you were going to go out to work and fly airplanes, not have some desk job doing, you know. Or, or staff papers. job someplace for some years like most guys d did then. So anyway, um, so <laughs> to get a pilot slot, uh, somebody had said, hey, you know, if you join the unit and, sh and once you're in, you have a better shot at it. So I was like, well, I, okay. And in the meantime, they'll pay me to ski race. So it sounds pretty good. So in 86, 1986, I went out on Christmas Eve and got a recruit. No, maybe it was the day after Christmas, the 26th, I think it was. And I got a recruiter to show up to work and <laughs> sign me up. And so we're going through this list. And uh, he's like, well, do you want to be an, an ejection seat technician? We have an opening for that. And I'm like, well, uh, do I have to go to school for that? And they're like, yeah, there's a eight month tech school for that. And I'm like, well, I don't really have time for that. Um, what else can I do? So we get on the list. He gets to, we get to cook. Do they have a school for that? I'm like, no, there's no school for cook. And so I'm like, okay, sign me up as a cook. <laughs> they're looking at me like, no yeah, yeah, exactly. They're looking at me like, are you, are you sure about that? I'm like, yeah, that'll work. And so, so I signed up as a cook. You're kill potatoes and, for your whole life. You know that, right? First class. Yeah. And, and then I was really setting myself up. So I was being in the unit. I go to Europe that year, where winter with the, with the biathlon te team and, uh, the U.S. biathlon team, and then afterward, I get sent over to the to the military world championships, the SISM races, and I'm standing there with this bag of uh, uniform stuff that somebody had given me along the way. As and uh, and I, there was a guy there who was from the Air Force who showed me where to put the pins, like the U.S. thing on the. You never even you'd never even built my uniform to go. Yeah, to, oh my to go into the opening 
ceremonies parade and and before that of course you, you march and so they're teaching me how to march you know that you left first foot left so you didn't and, go through a basic training like no, most man, guys the, yeah well later i did but, yeah. but this is all before that i'm like you know fast and furious into this ski racing thing you know yeah i gotta wear a uniform cool i gotta learn how to march cool so do that and then uh, and then uh and in in those races the fun thing was um they had a sport that an event that they called triathlon which was a biathlon race the skiing and shooting combined with a giant slalom so we took our alpine skis to europe with us and um not that year but the second year i spent a month training with the swiss national team running gates with those guys with a swiss ski coach telling me how to be better i actually got pretty good i mean i'm a good alpine racer once i got muscles later i was actually a pretty good skier but with a month of training with the swiss team and 1986 or no seven yeah um was pretty neat it really kind of uh so how did you how did you get to skiing with them just i met a swiss dude who invited me to hang out with them and, we, and i stayed in this swiss resort for a month skiing with the swiss national team oh my and gosh. it was yeah, that's awesome really, so it was that made me a better alpine racer which was cool in fact i was better than the guys that were dedicated alpine skiers for that i, I beat them in the giant slalom <laughs> no, I, it was like the, where's this kid he's a cook <laughs> yeah. so that story though the, the the funny thing about the cook thing was um that spring i went back to the pilot selection boards in the Boise guard. And I sit down across these four, uh, you know, colonels that are, that are choosing the guys they want to be in the squadron. And they're looking at across, across at me with this total, you know, like look of skepticism and sort right. of disgust. Like you did what? You know, they go, <laughs> you signed up how <laughs> yeah, they're like, you're in this unit. And I go, yep. And they go, and you signed up as a cook. And I go, yep. And, uh, and they look at me like, and then one guy looks at me and says, so what are you going to do if we don't pick you? And I go, well, you, you're going to pick me. <laughs> you don't have a choice. Yeah. And they actually, that made him smile. That broke the ice. And they, they're kind of like, okay, this guy's going to, he can be kind of cool. So like they, they, you know, we talked more. And then by the end of that thing, they were like, yep, we're going to give you a pilot training slot. Wow. So, yeah, that's how I, that's how I broke, they broke in. And, uh, and, and what a great decision that was. I mean, in, in so many ways that, you know, it was just, the, one of the, the cool things is, you know, I've had a lot of challenges in life, and I've failed a lot. I've I've screwed up a lot. Uh, you know, like anybody, if you right. think about that side of it, it's like, well, I can do it better a lot of ways, um, often including people. You know, but um, also just you know on inside personal stuff, I've I've failed myself in a lot of ways along the way for sure. Um, but there are other things that were you know the victory side, and so. Uh, with flying, my dad had been a pilot, as you mentioned, and, and he didn't. He wasn't good at making things like flying airplanes fun. He made, wasn't good at making much of anything fun in the moment. It was later where you appreciated that you you know you'd been inter- introduced to it. But with flying, I just never really connected with my dad, you know, and and uh, and so when I told him I was joining the Air Force, and and then later told him I got selected to go be a F four pilot, he was looking at me like cool good for you yeah "Yeah, that's a good deal and i was like yeah and it turned out to be a good deal because um you know the air force taught me how to fly you go to regular air force flight school and uh the first time you fly an air force jet it is pretty cool you know they've taught you all the systems and you sit in there with another guy and you go fly this little thing and do aerobatics my first flight in a a jet in the air force was pretty fun Uh, it's they call it your dollar ride and uh i was with this guy named Dave Heine and all the all the instructors that are flying this T thirty seven trainer at the time were kind of jaded. They're like, they'd really rather be fighter pilots, but they got to fly this damn thing and teach these kids how to fly. And yeah, like, eh. yeah, yeah. You know, so so not I'm washed across out, the, but kind of washed out. Yeah, so I sit across from him and uh, and I go, you know, they're supposed to do it. It's supposed to be like flown very conservatively because people that aren't used to flying airplanes get air sick. And so that, you know, to minimize the chance of, of the student getting air sick, you're supposed to go out and just fly the pattern and come back and land basically. Yeah. But you get time out in the, in the training areas. They show it's like a tour. And, uh, so, but I'm like, man, this airplane, we've, they've told us how to do like loops and rolls and stuff. And I, and I'm, and I'm just vibrating in the seat of getting to go fly this thing. Right <laughs> the first time. I'm looking across at Heine and I go, uh, Lieutenant Heine, you know, I've never been upside down in an airplane. I really want to see what it's like. And he, you know, kind of, and he, he goes, so you want to fuck around, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, yeah. <laughs> and, and so, and so we went out and, uh, and he kind of looks over at me at some point because it was a side by side, you know, whatever you call that tandem seat yeah. airplane or whatever the ones that were side by side. And, uh, I think Canada's for now. Never can get those technical <laughs> terms right. <laughs> But anyway, I flew them. Just don't know what that's yeah, called. Yeah, don't ask me the yeah <laughs> numbers. Anyway, uh, 
at some point he's like, hey, I'll show you a roll. So he shows me an aileron roll and, and he hands it to me and I do it and I do just exactly what he did it right. And it was like, and I, and I also kind of like, yeah. That and then it's awesome. It like, how about a you know, barrel roll? So we do that. Okay, how about a loop? And we do that. And then before you, by the end of this thing, I mean, we took that airplane hard through all of its paces. <laughs> we spun it like a bunch of times. And, and, and I'm like the whole time going, <laughs> just like just screaming and like yelling, you're on and a roller coaster. Yeah. And, we, and then, so we start high fiving and just having fun and laughing together. And so he and I became friends on that in that first you know yeah. hour of flying an airplane together. We just we just had so much fun. He had more fun than he'd had with anybody. Yeah, because he'd been doing he'd been doing yeah, tour like flights, the sleepy for... stuff, right? So so he he always tried to fly with me because we would always go out and just tear it up you know and <laughs> f around yeah 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 we'd go on cross countries together because you had to do you know some of those to the navigation thing and so one of our favorite games was when we're climbing out you know they give you a climb up to whatever altitude but we'd put a, a pen on the glare shield and then have contests to see who could float it in the air you know between to get the it, long to get it. You get it, like just so you'd be climbing up and, you, and then you push forward you kind of bump the airplane and you're kind of <laughs> doing that and you'd float the pen back and we you know have a count and then the other guy would do it and, and, and so the, it was just stuff like that where, yeah. or, or instead of just flying along Droning, you know, if there were clouds around, we'd go, Hey, how about a you know, altitude block and whatever? And we'd go down and zoom through the canyons of clouds. And, and, but he wasn't the only guy like that because one of the things that happened in flight training for me was I got a reputation of two things. I might know three. <laughs> one is, you know, a little bit of a wild card, but, um, the, guy, the instructors liked to fly with me because I was good. Yeah. Um, but also because I had fun and I made it fun for them. And, and one of that's one of been one of the things for me in flying ever since is, you know, if you're sitting in the cockpit airplane, you, you better put a smile on your face and enjoy it. And, and, and I always wouldn't have, I have somebody in the plane with me. I always encourage them to, I'm like, you need to fly, you know, have fun. Yeah. I'll show you this. Have you ever run upside down? <laughs> <laughs> Not until you took me. <laughs> yeah, right. You got a little bit of that. Yeah. One of these days I'll put a co- intercom in, a, in that airplane so that we can talk. I yeah. Have to do that. But yeah, the, but the, the funniest part of that is that so that at the ranch that you get in this, in the steerman, that old biplane that, I've been flying forever, and uh, and I still remember you, you know, being excited about it. But then I think you got a reputation for screaming like a girl. I did. I did. <laughs> I, 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 there's still people that that uh, have messaged me. Even actually, just happened this this last summer. You know, when it was coming up to an out there event, they asked if I was going to be screaming like a girl, yeah. and I always respond, I hope so. Yeah. Right. <laughs> hey, folks. I hope you're enjoying the content today. Today, I wanna talk a little bit about where you get your gear. Now, as hunters, we have a plethora of options, everything from big box stores to online retailers. But today, I wanna talk about Black Ovis and what makes them unique. BlackOvis.com is an online retailer. They've been doing it for a long time, and dare I say, the longest. They not only do they have unbelievable customer support, they also pick up all the brands you want, Zamberlin boots, cryptic clothing, you name it, they carry it. And unbelievable prices, they have a discount with us. So check them out, blackovis.com, and let them know that Ike sent you. We weren't really screaming. You were you were hooting and hollering as you should have been. It was giggling, it was giggling. Oh yeah, exactly. uncontrollably. Yeah, actually, yeah, it is yeah. hard not yeah. to. If yeah. you don't, if you're not having fun doing that, yeah. you gotta go find something else because that's not your deal. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That yeah, was so that much was fun. super fun. Yeah, we'll do it again for sure. So, so uh, military flew the F four. Yep. Did you fly the? You said you got deployed. Were you, did you get deployed in the F four? or Yeah. Was that later. Oh yeah. No. So it started in. Uh, the squadron when I came out here had reconnaissance birds, RF fours, and you know we were all like, eh, you know, wish it had a gun. But right. we did. We put AIM nine missiles on it, and so we did a lot of air to air combat training in that thing, which was pretty neat. I mean, it was um, they called them slicks or hard wing F fours. It didn't have slats like some of the other ones, so it was made to go fast. And 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 the cool thing about it, in retrospect, you know, was you know it was fun to take pictures, and it was. And I often now think about the artist part of me goes, gosh, I should have done more photography with that airplane because it had a you know this cool roving camera to take you know landscape shots and oh and, that was know, the I, intent was it was it's a it reconnaissance was, yeah you know, okay. cameras that you, oh, you yeah, got yeah, to, you yeah, know, yeah. You, it was made to go in like in in vietnam you know they'd, they'd send it up north and they'd take pictures of the bridges and stuff like that and so mm-hmm. that was the mission which was actually pretty fun you know it was interesting 
in itself, but the air to air part was really where it was fun. I mean, they yeah. taught us to fly that airplane hard and, and, you know, purposely depart it from quote controlled flight and, you know, to make it go different ways. We call them pirouettes, you know, we'd get the thing stalled and jack in the rudder and stomp on and, and it, it, it just some crazy <laughs> turn and you'd show up in a different place. And it was just fun to fight that airplane. Um, had it, that for a couple of years. And then the air force was in a, you know, one of those moments where they're trying to read, make some adjustments. And so they wanted to get a, rid of this airplane called the wild weasel, the F four G wild weasel, which mm-hmm. is an airplane that was designed to take out enemy radar sites uh, with a harm missile and absolutely the best thing ever built to do it because the, uh, there are airplanes that are still out there that, that shoot harm missiles, but most of them, to be truthful, don't hit their target because modern airplanes are too flexible. You know, they're, oh, they're, yeah. they're kind of bouncy and things are moving. And to accurately target the harm, the F-4 had these, these phased array radars on it that, that would receive the emitters mm-hmm. uh, and, and they could accurately pinpoint where it was and ac- accurately track where it was as you're maneuvering this jet around because the airplane was so stiff it didn't bend. And so the phased arrays relative to each other on the plane were, were accurate really good at they keeping track of where that thing was. And so, you know, if we pop an F, a harm off an F-4, um, it was probably going to hit that radar if the radar stayed on it would. So, uh, so the Air Force was trying to get out of that mission, but it, it had been so impactful in the Gulf War that uh, that had just happened uh, in the you know around the ninety mm-hmm. ninety one time frame ninety two. Um, the Air Force was trying to get out of the uh, Weasel mission, and uh, and they were going to you know mothball it, but Sony made them not, and so they decided to give it to the Air Guard. And so our unit was one of the units that converted to that. And it was really cool because at that time, that was a frontline mission. I mean, yeah. a lot of guys in the regular Air Force really resented that, that, that there was a guard unit getting this deployable frontline mission. And as soon as we were out of uh, Wild Weasel School, we were off to um, Iraq, you know, because they were still – the war was still on kind of the slow burn, right. uh, provide comfort in the south, in the north and, and southern watch in the south. So we'd either go to Saudi Arabia or Turkey and fly into northern or southern Iraq, um, you know, for a few years uh, monitoring the, you know, it was cool to fly into Saddam Hussein's Iraq. The yeah. first time I ever went over there, it was night and I'm flying this F-4 and we were all trained up on the thing and there are all these threat radars coming on, you know, like, I'm like, that's a ZSU 234, you know, a real one, <laughs> you know, it's like, holy <laughs> this is an yeah. assimilator. Yeah. yeah. And, and we'd go up at, if you went up at night, you'd see the Iraqis shooting at the Shiite Muslims that live down in the South and mm-hmm. there would be tracers going back and forth and things blowing up below you. And it was, there was wow. a war going on. And, uh, we were always impatiently trying to get into the war. We're like, gosh, you know, come on, shoot at us. And then one <laughs> night they did, you know, so one night I got to launch a harm back at the Iraqis. Really? And it was, yeah. It was pretty cool. It was, uh, moment of uh actually it was it was another funny funny moment it that uh, my my call sign had become craven by that time so I'm, it was just a craven moment i was in the front of this airplane and, and there was an f-15 strike eagle that it got shot at with by a sam by a, by a uh, surface air radar uh, missile and so i look over and this stupid f-15 guy doesn't do what he's trained to do he decides he's just going to try to outrun this thing so he, he goes oh, sam launch and he calls it i'm like what and it never, I've never seen that before. I look <laughs> over and, and I could see the afterburner plume of this F-15 going up and a, afterburn, and a missile plume coming behind him. And, he and goes, he's I'm catching going, him. I'm going to the moon. You know, so he thinks yeah. he's going to just go up and outrun this thing, which is not a good missile defense. No. So we're looking at that going. And, and so I go to my, my backseat. I'm, his name was Cavs. His call sign. I go, Cavs, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. You know, so because I've got the master arm on and the missile's teed up, but the backseater is the one that has to get the beeps and squeaks right, right. and hand it off to the missile. And, they, and so he's the one that when he knows it's ready, he'll, he'll pop it off. And so I'm like, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. And then <laughs> this missile goes roaring off into the night. Like, it feels like a telephone phone pole is launched off your wing and it's oh just my gosh. giant and you, and you can hear inside the jet you know this giant missile that goes whack and you know this zooms off and it's like whoa you know watching that was spectacular oh my god and so immediately i'm just like a little bit shock yeah i'm looking over at these you know two things and and uh, the flames you know going up trying to go straight up and uh and my flame going off into the night and then, you know, it just, just, just hit me. I just started laughing. I just, I was like, ah, yeah, I just started cracking. I'm like, oh, can I say bad words on your, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, hey, I go, ah, we, we shot that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it was a, you know, and so, so we, you know, big deal, you know, at that time there wasn't a lot of shooting going on in Iraq. So 
uh, and we were pretty teed up and there was, you know, there was actually a lot of shooting war going on below us and we were ostensibly there to protect the people that the Iraqis were aggressing. And so, you know, so we, you know, we kind of hoped that somebody else would shoot something so that we could shoot back at them. So (laughs) we spent most of the night up there going back to the tanker and coming back in and, and by the end of it, me and cabs were the only guys flying and the whole skies of Iraq were flying in a single F4 around up there because my flight lead had busted out. So the guy, my, my wingman. So, uh, we, yeah, I remember that night, just, you know, clear sky night roaming around the Southern, the skies Gosh. of Southern Iraq all by myself. And so every once in a while you do something fun, like, hey, well, you know, there's a SA3 site there. We'd, we'd point ourselves at him, at him and, and give him a sonic, sonic boom just to wake him up and break, <laughs> break some windows, you know? So <laughs> we kind of, we provoked a little bit, maybe. <laughs> but anyway, so we, that night, it's like three o'clock in the morning by the time we get back to the base at Dharan, land this airplane, taxi and this general's there. I'm like, oh yeah, we got to talk to the general. So we go into this debrief room, and there was this big machine that could recreate the exact thing that this that your that you your that tape happened. saw. That you can you, you can show what you what you, what it was and why you shot this missile. So, so we walk in this room, and my my backseater cabs is looking a little bit like a scan, a little bit sheepish, and he goes, oh my gosh, I, I hate to say this, but. I didn't have the con rack on during, you know, when I shot, I just turned it on right after. So he puts the tape in, turns it on. First thing on the tape is Craven cackling. Ah, we shot that fucker. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what he taped. And I'm like, the general looks at me, he goes, looks at Gabs. He says, you know, we tell him a little bit more about it. He goes, hey, he goes okay, well, we won't be playing that tape. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be, that one's not going on the news. We're going to stuff that somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, but the, but they were the, the the fun part. I mean, it's a funny story, but the truth is that was a really neat time of life because the F four Gs were the first guys across the fence going in, mm-hmm. and the last guys coming out, and it was just really neat to be meaningful and wanted. And and we had a lot of really cool adventures over there, just you know, flying around and you know in a in a hostile place. It was pretty was neat. Crazy. Yeah, and then I came back and. You know, we got converted to the A-10, and everybody, when I when they asked me about the things I flew, I'm like, ah, well, you know, uh, I flew the F-4, which if I could still, if they still had F-4s, I'd still be flying them. I mean, I just love that thing. I bonded yeah. with it, you know, and I've yeah. always missed it. Um, and the A-10, you know, we're like, we're going to the A-10? What? You know, it didn't feel like the right mission for, for us, but you embraced it, and I, you know, was eager to go fly it, and so uh, was one of the first guys to go from our squadron, and um and then it was just such a different airplane, different mission, the whole thing. But it was fun to learn how to fly it. You know, it was there was no simulators. The first time you get an A-10 and fly it, you sit in the seat. Now they're, I think they do have something that, but, you know, they had like a janky switch trainer that, you know, that told you the sequence that you. Right, But, but right. When you literally, you go start this airpline up and you have to remember how to start it. And you test the brakes coming out of the chalk and it oh just feels gosh. all funny. And then you go out and put the canopy down and you, you go fly it, you know. and, uh, and It's you, probably the, the equivalent of flying or driving a you know a sports car and then go and jumping in a tahoe it was completely yeah it's it is like that it was really weird i mean the f4 was so tight and hard and and you just had this immediate thrust you know just was like this cool badass muscle right. car of a hard airplane you know and the a10 was all loose it felt like it was put together with bungee cords <laughs> and you know stick your head up you open a panel stick your head up inside it's all hollow and there's like huh, this is this supposed to be full of stuff because the engines are outside of it you know it's just a strange airplane but but really effective and the you know the gow eight you know gun shooting 65 rounds a second of these giant bullets and I it's can't just because that, that thing was that thing was built built around the gun gun yeah, yeah. They, they built the gun and said okay now make it fly yeah you built an airplane around it yeah and it was really a smart airplane for what it does and it's still you know people now talk about how the a10's antique and needs to be gotten rid of them. like there's nothing that'll do what it does and, yeah. and anybody out there will tell you that i mean every time i talk to guys in the you know, now it, later life, it turns out I'm all engaged with a lot of guys in the military, and I'm close to a lot of those stories where they're like, "Hey, this is you know what an A10 did for me." And yeah, it, they were on the ground. Everybody when... wants to buy me beer because I flew one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, that was that was a pretty neat thing, and 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 then again, one of the other interesting things about that is air to air gunnery is marksmanship. You know, you basically are pointing your gun at something and you know making it happen yeah. just like you are if you're shooting a rifle or anything else so it's kind of fun yeah. that's awesome so the, the a10 the one of the the stories that i'd like you to tell is the because you ended up at top gun didn't you or at, oh at, at, yeah training. And, the, and the f4 
Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. I thought it was in the A10. I thought you guys were playing in in a. Well, that makes sense too, though. Yeah, because you were in a more archaic airplane than than yeah. what they were playing. Yeah, with. yeah. So that it was kind of fun because one of the fun things about the F4, especially in the Weasel, is we were really good at flying it. And and I already mentioned that you know we we had some tricks up our sleeves like departing controlled flight, so it went a different place than guys are used to seeing because a flight modern fly by air airplane won't do what those kind of airplanes would do if you. If you got into the right place and stomp on a rudder, right? <laughs> and so uh, uh, everybody wanted to fight us in the end, um, and and so is it because you guys had way more flight time, just because you were spending so much time over it was, there? It was that, and also back here we equipment. trained hard. I mean, we trained really hard in those things, and we 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 flew them as if we were going to go engage in MiG twenty nine, and we learned about how MiG twenty nines flew, and we mm-hmm. tried to figure out how you could beat them. And we'd fly against F-16s and F-15s, and sometimes they'd beat us, but oftentimes we'd, we'd beat them. Because we had this, this cool advantage in that weasel was that uh, if, if the guy you're fighting against had a radar, as they all do, we had some good tricks to really accurately counter counter them. And so, we, uh, you know, modern fighters have pulse Doppler radars, and if you go 90 degrees to them exactly like we could, then you'd fall off their screen. And so we'd have two jets, and uh, both guys would do that at a certain distance when they know they're, they're launching their missiles at us, and, and then we'd, in, we'd disappear and, and, sh- and do some sneaky stuff and then time it so that we could pitch into the fight when they didn't expect us. And you'd often, you know, have these airplanes flying by as you're rolling behind them and shoot them. They're like, yeah, I can't believe I just got beat by an F4. So it didn't always work that way, though, because sometimes, you know, so the thing at Top Gun was that we got invited to come down to the Top Gun school to the graduation ceremony. And so... Uh, it was really a fun clown show. These guys are, you know, all being serious, but the instructors are dressed, dressed in some like pirate costumes and stuff. And yeah. the students are all excited because they're, you know, there's something that the unknown they're going to get to fly against. And so there are different kinds of airplanes they invite to have dissimilar, you know, engagements on their on their um, graduation. So the Navy guys are flying F-18s, and you've got these F-4s out there and whatever else, or probably some F-16 guys too, and some other Navy pilots from different places to go against the Top Gun graduates is their final final thing. And of course, uh, what happens is the instructors choose the F-4s because they want to go fight an F-4. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't act, you know, but we don't know. So what they, what they did is they gave you a, uh, an envelope that had a point in the sky, uh, altitude, heading to be on, and uh, time over target, and what you're going to be armed with. So we okay. had like a single AIM-9 missile, a heat sinking missile, and a, and a gun. And okay. uh, uh, and then you don't know what the other guys got, but probably something similar. And uh, and then uh, we, you know, work this time, it's out over the ocean out of San Diego. It was still when Top Gun was at Miramar, just like the movie, right? Right. So, um, so we work out the time back to when we have to go out and start our engines and, you know, get out into the sky and, and be at that altitude and heading headed south over the ocean right. to find whatever, to fight whatever we find, you know? So, so we're going south and, and the F4 had a pretty good radar and I had a really good seat back seater. My, my buddy Cavs was in the back yep. again and I had, we had all this confidence together as a team and, uh, and Cavs is, is interrogating the, uh, IFF, the identification friend or foe, uh, squawks, and he's trying to find this airplane that's coming at us. And 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 every time he squirts it, it looks like Chicago Hare Airport. There's just like we're out over the ocean, middle of nowhere, and there and there's like millions of, or not millions, but dozens of airplanes that, that light up this scope every time. And so, so the whole way down, you know, my trusty backseater is just totally confused and can't figure out what's going on. And, and I'm looking out the window going, well, he's getting, got to be getting close to, you know, or the time or the airspace. And, and I see this F-18 going by. And I'm like, oh shit, yeah, you know, F-18 fights on. So we, so we pitch into the sky and I think I'm going to be, you know, fancy, you know, cause I'm going to, so I'm like, okay, uh, I'm going to, you know, get the nose up and do a pirouette and roll in on him and shoot him, you know? And and so I looking at him and I do this hard turn and I pull the nose up and I, and I'm, uh, watching him outside. And at some points I kind of feel the airplane slowing down. I look back inside and I'm going exactly straight up and I'm too slow. So I basically, I look inside and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to no. stall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not like a controlled stall at no. this point. This is like, oh, no. You know, you kick in the rudder and still nothing happens because the airplane's too slow. So basically, I'm, I'm just waiting. So I'm just sitting there going, <laughs> <laughs> waiting for everything to slow yeah. down just <laughs> enough. <laughs> Turns into a tail slide. <laughs> airplane basically, you know, pitches down and going the other way. And the whole you know, engine's still running, you know. I'm like, okay. But the whole way, it's just like way too much time wasted. And while, meanwhile, this F 18s watching this whole air show going, 
oh, what are you he doing? Rolls right around. Yeah, he's like, oh, that's not, that's pretty ugly. But when we when we rolled. In, you know, when, when the tail swapped and the nose is going down, I'm looking out the front at an aircraft carrier. You can look, look at it. Oh my airplanes gosh. in the pattern. And, and, and that was why my backseater was so confused is, is we were engaging straight over the top of this aircraft carrier. So if those guys were on deck were watching, they would see this airplane <laughs> <laughs> go, go straight up and stall and flutter around while the other one comes around and just shoots him. So the F-18, the instructor was like, well, you're dead. Like, yeah, we are. <laughs> so then we did a couple more engagements where it was more of a normal thing, but kind of a funny thing where you just go, wow, that didn't go the way I thought it would. Oops. Sometimes they didn't. Yeah. yeah but oh, fun, great. great memories though. I mean, I, those are the just moments where you go, yeah, I was really, you know, born under a lucky star to have been able to do things like that. And, you know, for real, be involved in things that were just, you know, so many different cool chapters of life. So the, the next chapter is you came home, um, you, you, how did you transition from the, I mean, obviously it's pretty easy transition from the military to being a commercial pilot. I mean, that's like yeah. what you do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it was never my intended path, but my dad had been a pilot, you know, a United pilot. And I remember him coming home because I always had this torn thing. I loved flying fighters and I loved the life in the squad and the camaraderie we had. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it's just cool being in the military, but I had just a bigger piece of life pulling at me. I mean, you know, back, in the eighties in college, I built this company in my head for a gear company. And I, and I, while I was on the biathlon tank team, I got involved in rifle stock design and I, and, and realized that I had design skills and really changed the sport of biathlon by making a lighter weight rifle. I'd done all that. And there's and actually I, a rule called the Eberly rule. Well, it, you know, it for, people have forgotten now what it was called, but the, but the rule still stands. I, I set the minimum weight for the Olympic class biathlon rifle by having been the guy that figured out that you can make a lighter weight rifle that doesn't break. And then also you can still shoot it, you know, cause we were carrying these heavy slabs around when I was in the sport and they broke easily when you fell. And, and so being an American, <laughs> I was like, I can fix that. I can do better. Yeah, and being, you know, me. <laughs> and so, yeah, in, in the eighties, 85, I pioneered a lightweight biathlon rifle stock that really did change the sport, you know? And, and, uh, so I had that, experience back there while I was doing all this airplane stuff and, and it was pulling at me. Um, so the mid to late nineties, um, I just, I, I decided that my path was going to change. And so, and I, and I remember my dad going, I don't have to work this month, you know, cause the thing about being an airline pilot is you have some balance time in life. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you go to work, but you're home. And, uh, and when you're home, you can do what you want. My dad had been a good soccer coach and ski coach and things and for kids and, you know, used his time that way and, and yeah. for just work, but, at, you know, around the house and right. mountains and stuff, but, um, and then later ranching. Right. Um, but for me, I was like, well, I, you know, I could maybe go build that gear company that, you know, I've been thinking about if I, if I step out of the military flying and get into the airline business. And, uh, so decided to do that. And in 1987 went to or 97 rather went to work at United and uh and it didn't take long at that time their company was moving pretty fast I was a captain within a few years and so I was a junior captain at United on September 11th oh and, yeah yeah people don't think about you know what an impact that had on the airline industry but it was huge especially for the companies like ours that were one of the ones that went into the buildings shocking day I mean I just I never have felt so devastated as I did that day and just like took it personally you know it still brings tears to my eyes to yeah. think about it and uh and so in that moment that day i decided that i was going to start this gear company that i'd built in my head in 1985 and through 87 i'd really kind of thought it all through and explored it and designed my first pack in 1987 and uh it built them for myself in the squadron uh parachute shop through the 90s and had some pretty cool ideas sitting there you know the rifle scabbard in a pack yeah. and expandable packs to car carry elk out of the woods if you were by yourself like I usually was. <laughs> and uh, and so I had all that stuff there and, and I was really hungry for it. Um, but then on September 11th, I was awake and I decided, okay, man, I mean, I w my first impulse was to go back and get back in the A-10 and go to war because I knew we were going to do that. And I, that was my calling. Um, I actually wrote the letter to, that would have made that happen. And you then did. my guys went to war, you know, the, my squadron went and did, you know, some remarkable things in both Afghanistan and Iraq. And, but I was like, ah, you know, I've been in and out of that enough. I should actually do this other thing, you know, sort of as a, 
defensive maneuver, you know, for myself and my family, but also mm-hmm. because I, you know, I felt like there was, I mean, I really, at that time I had rifle designs that were unique and I thought my first goal was to build a sniper rifle that killed Osama bin Laden. I was like, I want to, I want to make those guys things that they need you know and and so uh it turns out i didn't do that (laughs) but i built some pretty cool rifles you know the first chassis guns that i'd ever heard of came out of my head and a a local machine shop here yeah and i've Um, I've shot a couple of them yeah they're really neat yeah really neat designs and some of the older stuff is you know probably before what you shot but yeah but still the concepts were pretty cool the modular things that people weren't doing and uh but i also had these pack ideas and so Figured out how you make backpacks. I had a, I'd had a uh, friend who later had become the president of the North Face, and so I called him up and asked him where to go to make packs, and he told me, and it led me to some people that helped me, you know, figure out how to turn a concept into a commercially producible design. And a mm-hmm. couple years later, we had some pretty good product coming off the line, and uh, and I was figuring out how you build a company, but also really kind of. You know, I, I mean, I, I worked hard. I bootstrapped it. I didn't have much money to put into it. And I was really feeling like we were vulnerable, like that company I worked for, you could go out of business any day, you yeah. know? And, and so I was not spending money if I didn't have to. And I was working day and night and, uh, uh, and did everything myself if I could, man. I, I, if I didn't have to spend money, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Figured out how to do write patents and do web design. It was, I was terrible at it. My, you know, they were <laughs> both of them could have been a lot better had I gotten professional help early on, but I didn't spend money on it. And, and it got just into the market. And, uh, and then I always knew that, you know, the game was not, w- w- was best focused on building a brand. You know, if you could, if you can build a brand that by the time that people start figuring out your unique ideas and ways to do something that mimics them, you know, everybody knows. Yeah. Then you, you know, if you have a brand, they really, they can make something similar, but they can't be you. And so that was sort of my target and my, my goal as a, you know, bootstrapping entrepreneur. And and it was the right one. I'm really, you know, if I've done anything that I can say, um, I think, I feel like I did well. It was building this company that became Everly Stock and, and in a unique way. I mean, we'd be a lot bigger had I, had I not insisted on doing everything myself for so long um, you never know but, though but you never know you know it was played out that yeah. way and that's that's the card you did the cards you're handed yeah, yeah that's and how. the other thing is you know i still own it and yeah. and you know had, i've never taken investors yeah. i've survived disaster i mean the building next door that uh yeah. now is our headquarters and warehouse uh the fr- was our first warehouse first big one um, it burned down, you know, in 2010 with all my yeah. stuff in it, with all my product uninsured, yeah. uninsured <laughs> so, and, and yeah. in a brand new building. Yeah. Or one that we were, yeah, it was an old building that we were you know, just, just about finished remodeling. Right. Right. And so, yeah, it was a, but it was what a devastating disaster, you know, and, and I'd said earlier that, you know, I'd never felt more devastated than I did on September 11th. Well, hearing the news that my building was burning down was right up there and you were here you were yeah you were coming back uh, from a trade show when we were in in, 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 i'd been in indy for ata archery trade and then was coming through o'hare and got a call from a buddy that said i think your new building's on fire i was like what i called my neighbor and he goes you don't even have a building it was i'm like oh thanks for letting me know (laughs) but that was just a horrible horrible moment and day i finally oh and i was traveling space available on united <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's airplane, not like you get there filled up and they shut the door without me and i was like oh geez so i spent the day in o'hare airport you know just like mourning the, the, the loss of all these things that i'd built without even really being able to think about the fact that you know i, I never thought about the money i'd made i thought about what i was going to do with it to build the next generation of product and whatever mm-hmm. and so here i was like Oof, and I thought, well you know sometime in my history i've had as little money and as little product as i have right now so i'm just back at that point and i've got to do it again you know but the good thing in the process was I also knew that we had become a brand. We were just, it was 2010. We, you yeah. know, the 09, 08 seasons had been good to us in terms of like people waking up, waking up about what we had on both the tactical side, the military, you know, sniper side and the hunting side. And yeah. so uh, we went to the shot show with packs. We pulled out of the bottom of the rubble uh, a couple of days after I got back. I mean, I was Saturday in Chicago Got back at 11 o'clock that night and walked into over here into a, a smoking ruin and uh, mm. came down the next day on Sunday and was just just gutted, you know. Oh. But walking over the, you know, six feet deep ash heap with timbers charred sticking out of it and, yeah. you know, the thing that had been my prize building. Yeah. <laughs> I know yeah. I was lo- 
looked down and I saw this blackened corner of a bo- uh, what I was like, that's a cardboard box. And I pushed the stuff aside and I was, you know, like, there's a, you, you wouldn't even think that a cardboard box could survive. It was a huge, devastating fire. You yeah. Know, it was like really, the fire department couldn't put it out. This building burned and until everything it, in it burned until it, until it was, they flooded it with water all day, but it was a, wow. Because, you know, 5,000 pa- packs made an nylon burn pretty good. <laughs> yeah, in cardboard <laughs> Plus boxes. Old, this old, you know, old. antique building and all the timbers and it was yeah. made of wood. And, oh, good. It was a huge fire. I, so while I was in Chicago, I mustered up the courage to put my computer on the internet and watch my building burn down on Channel 7 News going, yep, yeah, that was it. It happened that middle, early that morning. Gosh. So anyway, um, so I did, I'm thinking, well, was it what's in a cardboard box is black you know and open up the top and the, there's a melted pack on top and i'm like yeah you know and pull that away and the one underneath you can see the face of it the sides were all melted but i was like gosh you know so Steep, so we started digging, digging down deep. and we got down to the core you know pieces of the stacks and we started pulling out some packs that stunk like holy heck but they were viable and i still have people that say hey i got one of your smoky packs from you <laughs> 2010 you know, there's still a bunch of them running around out there uh, but but they also were sort of our bridge to survival. And then at the shot show, the we were the shot show started on Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. So we ended up flying to Vegas early Monday morning, set up for the shot show, and had these smoked packs in our booth. And people were like, "What's that smell?" As they're walking by, I'm like, "Well, we had a little fire." <laughs> and <laughs> then here, the, don't worry, the, it wasn't the, here. The, yeah, the big buyers uh, were pretty cool. You know, the Barson Sportsman's Warehouse, and at the time, Cabela's was a good account, and so they wrote some generous POs to you know, because I, I said, "Hey, I'm not going to have much product for three months, but when I do, I I need you to buy it." And yeah. and they did. So by the end of that year, we actually grew. Wow. I didn't have much money. I mean, I I really had to be careful with it again and you know went back to that survival bootstrap mode Mm -hmm. and work glenn working his butt off mode (laughs) night and day so thinking about those days you know i i think back to the f4 you know and i had this there's this really cool sound in the cockpit when you're going fast and you lit the afterburners and that you know you could just feel that airplane and hear it and you just sense it this this roaring thing that you know that was in your ears body soul you know and when I, after the fire i felt like i was running with the afterburners on for years i mean i just had that that sound was in my head wow. of like you know and it felt like i had to do it you know i had, had to survive that and then we did uh and the downside of it was it took a lot out of me you know i there was a lot of energy spent again in a yeah. in a in a in in, in life you can only do so many cycles of that before it starts to to take a toll yeah and uh and it also in some ways uh it was such an achievement i mean most the insurance company sure hoped i'd go out of business the guy that the the guys that were fighting me on the building i knew the product was lost and i all that money was gone but the building was another story i'd written a premium check a check for the premium and and I, they should have written me a check on day one for what happened, but it didn't turn, turn out that way. So yeah. I had to fight that, you know, three years later all before we settled with those sons of bitches. Yeah. yeah. So somehow we survived all that, rebuilt the building, and eventually got a check for the pittance that they should have paid me on day one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I just held with it and sued them, I'd have had a couple extra million bucks, and I, they deserved it. But I just wanted to move on, so I just finally got it moved on. So anyway, that the point of all that is that coming out of it, um, you know, I fought through it, but I was pretty worn out. And, uh, and it was also at a time when other brands were rising. I mean, I'd shown people what a performance gear company looks like. And so there were a lot of people coming at me on both the tactical side and the hunting side. And there was a lot of things that, you know, the new guys and everybody's trying to, you know, beat me. And so there's different things that, were happening in the market that I didn't really pay attention to the rise of Amazon didn't pay attention to it. Social media, it's not my style. (laughs) So, so, uh, we let a lot of people into the space without fighting them in the way that we should have, which I, you know, again, if you could do it over, you'd, I'd I'd have attended to those things differently in the mid teens. Of course, hindsight's Um, 2020, right? Yeah. But again, I can look at all of it now and go, huh, it's cool. Cause the, a lot of those companies are gone. You know, the, the flash in the pan thing, they come and go. And, and meanwhile, you know, steadfast, Everly stock, we're always just looking at this going, okay, what can we do better? How do we, how do we fix that? You know, and when I realized that I'd missed that rise of social media and Amazon and whatever else and decided to fix it, I also decided it was time to build a company that, you know, was staffed with people that would attend to things that, you know, that, and also I was sort of done with that night and day work thing I'd been doing. So... It was pretty neat for me, again, in the sequence of things, just to decide to 
turn this over to some other people, you know, let other people into the, in, you know, the inside of the secret sauce and, and get, you know, good lieutenants and captains building things and working on things for me. And it's gotten to the point now where I have a good crew that runs this company yeah. and I, and I trust and love them all. And each guy fits a special spot and each guy knows it. And, uh, and they're the company. I'm just the just steering the ship a little bit here and there, but a lot of times flying airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is another chapter. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it is really interesting to me how, your, your innovation started in the 80s about weight yeah. and and functionality and you know core strength you know you saw a rifle that was too heavy when you fell on it and you broke it and yeah. that ended you know it potentially could end end a dream or your career in whatever yep. no matter if it was an american or yep. anyone yep and fast forward you're still making lightweight still making extremely strong in fact uh before this podcast we walked through and your team was showing us a, 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 a test dummy yeah test dummy i guess is what you call it it's built out of steel plate yeah. steel yeah it's really really neat but the whole intent was so that you can put backpacks on this test dummy yeah strap them in properly as if it was a human being not that they could ever hold this but yep. it's a a steel human being yep. and see where you know where where, where are yeah where do they yeah. break and, and can we fix that do we need to fix it yeah. i mean is 700 pounds enough yeah. i don't know <laughs> yeah. I, well, yeah, I, mean, I hope i never have to pack that much on i'm sure we'll pack. learn something at some point but honestly I, I know our packs are well enough made i mean we'll, we'll, we'll put we'll put a hydration pack on that that'll carry hundreds of pounds oh my gosh and you know and of course a human can't do that but the things are all structurally that way you know and, it, and it's fun to find a place where you go, oh, you know, we missed a bar tack somewhere in the design of this or the, you know, the, the spec mm -hmm. of it. So we, it, when we find those, we fix them, yeah. which is one reason why, you know, I, I got a message from New Zealand this morning of a, a friend that's down there that was with a guide with an old, old, old Everly stock pack. And he's been guiding, hauling stuff out of the mountains in New Zealand for years with that thing. And it still Jeez. looks like new, you know, and, and uh, he, the guy's all, you know, it's New Zealand twang, all oh, proud yeah. of it, you know, and yeah. it's kind of fun because that's, you know, we make that kind of product that lasts a long right. time and, you know, multiple deployments to war with our tactical packs and year after year with hunting packs and, you know, to the point where some guys get tired of them, they can try something else, but that old Everly stock pack is still reliable. You know, by the way, we're getting getting better at it you know we have some new stuff that's really cool and really good and it's fun in fact um, one of the cool things is i've talked about this team here is uh you know serendipitously this past year i've just been at a place in life where i'm, I'm working more and more to building it for its future which isn't going to include me at some point and yeah. so uh, for whatever reason and so uh, not looking to sell the company but i just realized that it's time for me to make sure that it's ready for its own future and uh and so uh there's a local guy here named jay uh robert who had built yeah. a company called black street guy gear oh, i remember he, yeah wow. and then and then was involved and he was the brains behind the designs at tenzing when they built that and yeah. he and i have always been friends we've been friends for he was the first guy I ever tried to sell a hunting back to he had a store out in Nampa and I had no idea that he had a pack company. Yeah, he had no he, idea. He, he thought I was Black Streak. Yeah, he was the he was Black Streak or, or the, you know the, on the design side he had a partner in it but yeah. um, I didn't know that. I, I was there to talk to about his retail store and if he'd carry these new cool hunting packs I, I made. And so right. this was 03 and uh, and Jay thought I was coming to show him a pack design for his pack company and so we had this conversation over lunch and we figure out that no we're talking about two different things and so anyway he's been think we're here yeah he's been through but that also started our relationship we grew we respected each other because of our, our positions at the in that moment and we realized that also that we were going to be competitors to some degree and then later so we I mean he won't say it he wouldn't say it at the time but he was gunning for Everly stock when he put yeah. up Tenzing up with Plano and uh, uh, and so as things have evolved he'd moved out of the business and gone on in life but still lived around here and uh and you know we i designed everything that's in this room except for a few things that have you know come on in the last few years and so right um you realize along the way that you know I, that course has also run its course and i can still do it but i'd like better to have other guy teach other guys and and give them inputs about small things that but otherwise let them go you know see what happens like um, nathaniel tong over here design our recon bino harness which is the best bino harness in the business absolutely yeah, it's and unbelievable yeah it's, it's just the a one cool... i go to every time it is unbelievable. i would hope so <laughs> it is yeah <laughs> yeah but, it's modular but, and it, yeah. it allows you to change depending it. on what hunt you're going on because you yeah. don't go on the same hunt every time right and each hunt requires something slightly different yeah 
Yeah, and it's an elegant little yeah. design, just what it should be. And so it's fun. And we have a bunch more stuff coming like that that are just like, when you, you're looking at me, go, hey, yeah, good for you, Nate. You did a yeah. good job, you know? And, and so for me, nice to have that kind of brains in the in the family. But with Jay now coming on board, he's like, he's all excited. He's like, you know, together, we're really going to, we're going to, be unstoppable and, yeah. and that's a nice attitude to have so yeah he, he came to work for us just a little bit ago and it's kind of fun yeah it was it was, it was surreal to walk into the everly stock uh headquarters and jb sitting in, in, at a desk i went i i knew this i knew he was here but it was really surreal yeah because you guys were fierce competitors for a, a number of years friendly you know? fierce competitors yes you know I mean? but he, not, yeah, yeah not but yeah not but we you know looking at each other's yeah. stuff going oh nice yeah, yeah that, that i never thought. looked I didn't. You're right. Yet. You're I right. I actually, remember. the thing about Jay, the, the cool thing is, we respected each other, and and so he was one of the competitors that steered clear of me, and I steered clear of him. You know, he did. Yeah. He he tried to match. You know, the function of things, but he never encroached on my designs or concepts. And yeah. you know, the patents didn't matter with people like that. It's it's respect. That's how it's supposed to be anyway. Yeah. So uh, and 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 literally, I never. I had a guy one time walking with a Black's Creek pack going, oh, yeah, you got to make your thing like this. And he showed me all this stuff. And he wanted me to, you know, copy features on this pack. And I just was looking at him like, what? And I just, I said, you just take that thing and walk right back out that door. And yeah. that didn't happen. And, you know, so uh, that's literally, I think, the only time I ever had a close look at a competitor's pack. And it was just you know made my skin crawl yeah. um because it wasn't my style and but also it wasn't jay's style and so it's been fun to have that relationship and again just fun i was laughing this morning when you were there i'm like hey look he's got never really sock hat on <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's neat because again um for me i've i really can look at all this and feel like i've fulfilled this for myself i i you know it, this company's got a huge future it's really strong, and yes. we're doing some cool stuff that's going to really, you know, take it into a, a bigger and broader future for sure. For me, it's kind of neat to know that other people are going to do it, and and uh, I'll, you know, for as long as I live, I'll I'll be part of it in some way. But I, I love the fact that I have other people motivated to. Well, and you guys it. have have gone from packs. You know, we're sitting in a in a showroom, and I'm surrounded by clothing too. Yeah. You've 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 broke into apparel. Um, you have some really cool designs and some really unique stuff there. Uh, and more on the way. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a new, yeah, that's one where you just look at, cause it goes all the way back to that 1987 thing. I remember I'm talking to the guy who runs North Face and you're going, well, how do I do what you're doing? But, you know, packs with guns. Yeah. And, uh, how do I do uh, your, what you're doing in camouflage color? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'd always had the vision of a broad-based gear company, you know, more than packs. It just happened that packs became our forte and, 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 Thankfully, so I mean, we yeah. had, had such a big impact on the industry, but also the way that people approach hunting um, yeah. has changed because of what I've done. And and uh, the military side, huge difference made to snipers, particularly, but yeah. other special ops guys that use our stuff. You know, we've literally made a huge, huge impact in, in the way the guys go to war. That who could have imagined that? You know, I, yeah. could, I can look at that and go, gosh, you know. I've had a pretty cool life. I, you know, I saved I've, those I, guys' lives because I was able to cover yeah. their guns up. Yeah, so they people tell literally the came back was. and you know told me that that yeah. you know that there was a time in Iraq when the snipers were getting shot. You watch the movie American Sniper, and man, that guy throws a scope rifle around his body and he's a target. Yeah, and uh, and so yeah, our packs did change the matrix for a while until the bad guys figured out that the what, what an Everly stock pack was. <laughs> <laughs> they started shooting the guys. They got Google but, too, yeah, damn it. Yeah, but by the time that happened, we were, you know, well into the way with the hearts and minds of the American snipers. So, and other, other guys too. Well, and you guys are going, um, you're going into clothing. You're, uh, yeah. you obviously the packs, you're going into uh, other gear. Mm -hmm. Um, are, is there still plans to go? The, the, the whole name of the company is Everly Stock because yeah. of the stock. It yeah. was started as a stock, a rifle stock company. Right. Is there still plans to go into that? I don't know. I mean, I, I love my designs. I still have some unique designs that nobody's ever built. And, uh, and I may play with them some because again I'm looking at a time of life now where I'm like okay I'm gonna, I'm I'm still going to go forward and um, step aside while these guys you know. Jay and Nate and whoever else are building our packs and uh, 
designing them and, and yeah. then the team's making all that stuff, stuff happen to bring to market and I can look at it with comfort and, and, and it's almost better for them if I if I keep his hands off as possible. So I'm going to have some time and I've got a warehouse over there with a shop in it and I might play with some gun stuff. But I, <laughs> you know, a little we, cave over there with... Yeah. But the truth is, um, you know, we're, we're pretty tight with the guys at Seekins mm-hmm. uh, Precision in North, Northern Idaho. And, Great uh, guys. Matty's one of my yeah, favorites. Just, and, and Glenn Seekins is a really mm-hmm. solid guy also. And, it, and, and I, having been through their company and see how they do business and how they work, I'm like, yeah, you know what? If, we ever, if I ever do a stock design, I'll partner with somebody like that. Right. And, and, and that would be my first go is just to say, hey, you know, this is the thing that you make and it's wonderful. I mean, I, that rifle with the stock, the Seekins Steak, yeah. stock that I took to Alaska, I love that thing. Yeah. And, and and respect them well enough that I didn't, you know, go change it into one of my own stocks. <laughs> but I might sometime play with it and just have them shoot it. You know, you shoot one, shoot, the, shoot you, you feel the difference. And right. I think that I have some design ideas that have a lot of merit. So it'd be fun to pursue that just because, again, it, it kind of opens up the next chapter. But I doubt that you'll see Everly stock with an Everly. You know, we might have one that's tied to a company like that. But, I, you know, I've, I've made chassis guns and people go, why? You know, I still have a bunch of them. One of these days, maybe I'll make some of the more Everly stock chassis because <laughs> you know, it's just a fun thing. To, I did that really to show people, first of all, that I had first generation ideas. The first time I ever saw a Remington chassis gun, I knew it was copied from my idea because I'd showed it to Remington and. 1990 something really I had a guy told me from, I used to work with their custom shop and I had okay. a guy from the custom shop tell me hey they just knocked you off and I was like oh I never thought about that <laughs> well, they would do that <laughs> yeah. that makes sense and so yeah. in th- in when I saw the thing totally respect what they did I mean it, it was better and cooler and more badass than anything that had been in my head but the concept behind it was right. I knew where it came from and so um, that offended me. Um, and it also kind of lit me up. So I, I decided to go make some modular chassis guns. And then I made another one that's a solid piece one that's pretty cool. And so I've made a few of them just to make people go, I thought you were a pack company. Why are you doing that? Well, well the name's Everly Stock. Yeah. Here's why. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have anything yeah. to do with anything but rifles. Yeah. <laughs> this is why yeah. it was named that way. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it's fun to, fun to have that kind of in the gene pool. Um, uh, but the core of our business is, is really, you know, like I'm looking at a rack of gloves and socks over there that go with the, you know, vests and Merino base and the, you know, all the rest of this stuff. And, uh, you know, packs and that kind of gear is, I think where, where the part of the company is going to stay, yeah. but, uh, you know, nothing says, you know, lightweight tents or sleeping bags sleeping or other things would become part you guys of that have so. we were talking brandon and i were talking about that on the way down here we actually have some everly stock shelters yeah oh yeah first generation from a long time ago yeah 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 and they're they're you know i would do it differently if i go back to that mm-hmm. you know those were good lesson kind of points and i actually partnered with an austrian company for the sleeping bags yep. and they're still i think make the best sleeping bags for you know a synthetic fill sleeping bag so you know, I hesitate to work around partners like that, and we may continue that. Um, and the truth is also on the tent side, when I said tents, um, I went to Alaska with a Hilleberg uh, tent mm-hmm. and was just blown away by that thing, how Seems, good it was. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I mean, I look at that product as a model product for anybody who, you know, like for us as a manufacturer, we should be that good, and we try to be, but Hilleberg is that good. I mean, I, I, that tent was flawless, you know, easy to put up in high wind on top of a mountain and just in nasty rainstorm. conditions. And I'd get in that thing and go, oh, man, this is a nice little home. And so, yeah. and I like the the folks at Petra at, at Hilleberg and is, you know, become a friend. And yeah. the, uh, her her mate, Stuart Craig, mm-hmm. is a guy I went to college with, you know. So it's oh, really? Kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, we, we, we looked at each other when we were on the ski team at Dartmouth together in the 80s. And we were just kind of <laughs> laugh about it, like, I'll be darned, you know, look at, look at life. Huh. But, uh, that's uh, yeah. we, I spend a lot of of nights in a Hilleberg tent. They, yeah, they, they do, and yeah. I spend a lot of nights, uncomfortable nights, and other ones that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and again, for me, that you know, when you're exhausted, uh, the ease of putting it up or taking it down, or and, or, and then it's hands you know, are cold. Yeah, yeah. All your yeah, stuff sitting there things so they're on. just so right. So the truth is, again, I. If ever we dabble in that, it'll be partly in partnership with them. But it, I really have no reason to try to expect to compete against them. Because the, the other thing is the way I'm wired. You know, if I wanted to make a tent, I'd have to be better than that. Yeah. And I'm looking. Oh, I got That's probably not. That's, that's pretty kind of a long shot. Well, <laughs> so. that's you know that's a good point because that's one of the things that you set out for 
you know, all the way back with the stocks, you know, yeah. during the biathlon is I can do better. I yeah. can make a better pack. I yeah. I will not settle for layer. second best. It. it just, yes. it's just, it just, I look at this and yeah, you know, some of our stuff, uh, it, it could be lighter weight, but it's purposely built the way it is. It's built to be efficient. It weighs what it weighs because of its feature set and the yeah. materials that are made. I mean, it, the first thing is for a pack, it has to survive what you do with it. You know, yeah. you can't be in the middle of nowhere and have a pack that breaks because you picked up an elk quarter. And and so we, Eberly Stock is a brand and a company, um, forged the path to make structurally sound packs so that, so that you know, their two things are comfortable so they don't hurt you. Yeah. And then and then they're intuitive, easy to use. So that's, I guess, the second thing. And then, But a third thing is they're, they're made to be reliable you right. know that's and so they used. last year yeah use them hard and they last year after year and and uh and it's fun we're going to actually prove that now as you said you talk about the test rig but we're going to break every pack we have and show people how many hundreds of pounds it takes to break them and then like you said we'll learn some things from it but it's going to be fun to do too yeah it'll be but, fun to watch if nothing else yeah the- in the meantime you know we're tending to the lightweight thing you know the like i like i said i you know second best is i don't settle for that and yeah. and, and so they're are people pushing at us all the time out there trying to beat us? And in some cases, I look at their stuff. I, I just say I look at their stuff. I hear about their stuff. I really haven't ever looked at one. Right. <laughs> but I know it's out there. People are, you know, doing stuff. And I know there are other ways to build things. And I'm always hungry for that. You know, it's like, oh, you know, let's let's try this. And so we have some new, new designs that will be coming out that I think are going to be the next leaders as yeah. they should be. Yep. Sure. And the fabrics change and the materials yep. change and, you know, just yep. everything, yep. which is good. It's progression. Yep. That's how it's supposed to be. Yep. And, and, and customers' expectations change. Yeah, that's another part of it is that we have to respond to that and know that, you know, we have to be relevant and and, 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 and leader. I mean, I've told the guys in the, in the team, I'm like, you know what, Everly Stock – is the leader in this industry and we need to remain that that's our that's yeah. our that's our mission and yeah. and so um it's kind of it's fun to think that way yeah. and it's well, also you got, fun. you got a great team you know yeah. i've known these guys uh, since since they've started here because because yeah. you and i've known each other when it was yeah. just glenn <laughs> yeah, right. pre pre the fire everything <laughs> yeah. and uh it, yeah. and it's it, you have one heck of a team really yeah. knowledgeable and understanding and and uh really great designs really great business and so yeah. i appreciate our, appreciate our relationship not yeah. just business but also personally yeah and it's been a, a lot of fun um yeah, it's fun to watch you go too. I, well, so. <laughs> I don't know. I was yeah. changing my tire at ten o'clock last night in the, in the dark almost, and I would, myself, I would like to watch that. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, "What am I doing? <laughs> I should get yeah. an airplane." Is what yeah, I was really yeah, thinking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, you should. You know, four of them's not enough. I'll tell you that. You know, it's like, oh, let's see, I need a faster one now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was. Uh, I was just a couple weeks ago. I was over at Sheridan, Wyoming, talking to uh, Adam Weatherby, who just purchased yeah. a new airplane. He okay. was also a pilot. Yeah. And he was telling me, you know, I, I did this. He did a big trip for SHOT Show and, and all the other dealer shows and yeah. Safari Club and Sheep Show and stuff. And he did it in his airplane. I was sitting there going, yeah, I took commercial flights. That yeah. was fun. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, it might be slower, like in a beaver. You take a beaver to the East Coast and it's like a long, but I'm never bored. Yeah. And, and just it's enjoy the adventure. scenery. And yeah, you sometimes you buzz down low and, you know, fly through the hollows and canyons and over the treetops and yeah, it puts yeah. a smile on my face. We're going on. I think about flying on a commercial oh. flight, and I'm like, I just don't get excited about it. So no. it's, yeah, the the freedom of flying yourself around is is worth it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on, and I uh, appreciate everything. Uh, yeah, everything thanks. You guys are thanks doing. for coming over and seeing us, and yeah. it's really a joy to see you. I can. Yeah. I appreciate we'll everything some. as well. And then, and again, this morning you showed me that that magazine <laughs> of my sheep hunt. And I'm just blown away by it. I just have to say thank you. It's yeah. a, it's the nicest thing, and I I really it's it's interesting because I have been part of the Eastman's world since. 2005 yeah somewhere in that, yep. that range I think so it was six i looked it up no, I think six, it was 2006. Yeah, okay so for how many do the math however many years that is 17 <laughs> years <laughs> but um you know i've always appreciated the relationship because we've always liked each other and been friends yep. and, and i think you know it's sort of like talking about jay robert and i you know just mm-hmm. you respect each other in a way that yeah. it's nice to have men in your life that are like that you know but but on the magazine side i've always felt like first of all i used to do a lot of the photography and the artwork and the design. And stuff and the yeah. design, of course but but I was also the, you know half baked doing things that I just never felt like we were presenting our brand as well as we could um, and so now I have 
good staff that like Casey yeah. went to Alaska with me and the pictures that are in your magazine are from Casey and they're just brilliant, you know, yeah. and, and, and evocative of the, of the, what this brand is, but also of the trip and the journey, the adventure, the whole thing. And then yeah. you guys did a great job of putting it together. And for me, it's just an honor to be, <laughs> you know, to, to have an opportunity in life to have that displayed and in, in partnership with you. So it's really kind of a cool moment. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it's, it's easy to do when you have great photography on an epic adventure like yeah. you had. Yeah. And, and it was an epic adventure. <laughs> yeah. If you guys, if the audience hasn't uh, seen it, 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 there's a YouTube, um, uh, YouTube film that you guys built, yep. and it's it's called um, the a, f- a full measure. Yeah, I was going to say the full yeah. measure. Yeah, and uh, it's Glenn's sheep hunt, and it and it's more than just a hunt, which is so much fun. Yeah. Um, it was it was awesome to see it at yeah. shot shows at the premiere. Yeah, and it's 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 neat. It's one yeah. of those adventures that allows guys myself included to go dream go man someday i want to do that yeah someday i want to fly a plane my own plane all the way up there just like my grandfather did go yeah. on a sheep hunt an epic adventure and fly all the way home yeah you got to do it you've got yeah. that's just I right know. in front of you man yeah, and for because you're a pilot and you got you've got the i hope i don't have to do it in a super cub though <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the beaver was for you know beaver on floats amphib floats to go up there was really neat uh, that's the way to do it yeah. um and maybe we could do that together i don't know because <laughs> yeah. i it, for me i developed a lot of respect for the for alaskan aviation i mean i've flown through idaho I've, I've done all kinds of things with airplanes but going up there you know by myself with a beaver into alaska was breathtaking at times and scary as heck at other yeah. times and and uh always breathtaking yeah <laughs> but there's times when your breath is taken away by the fact that you're just inside of a cloud <laughs> while you're inside of a canyon and you really don't want to be there <laughs> <laughs> breathtaking in the sense that you suck the air out of the cabin also breathtaking in awe <laughs> yeah like oh i might die in any minute here yeah, yeah, but anyway um, an awesome you got any yeah. big adventures coming up this this fall yeah well yes um you know, the full measure film was done by a guy from Wales, yep. the UK, named Jack Bottoms. Just a great dude. And the kind of person, once you meet him, you want to do more with him. And also, um, that's really just the first step in telling our story. There's a lot more, you know. So we're going to bring him back to Idaho. Um, I'm a little bit broken inside physically, so I'm kind of working on that. But um, I'm hoping that I can go on that hunt. Uh, but you know, I've got a ranch in the middle of nowhere in the mm-hmm. back country that my dad had, and and, and now it's mine, and uh, and it's got a hunting uh, guide permit area around it that we're going to reclaim. And mm-hmm. when I say reclaim, it hasn't been used in years, and so basically, there's this vast area up there around this remote been. ranch that hasn't been hunted well. I mean, I've I've poked into it a couple times, but I'm really excited about telling that story, you know, and because it's going to be a sniff the air and start, you know, walk into the wilderness and see what happens kind of a hunt. And so we're going to do that in September with Jack again, filming it. And so we'll, we'll, that'll be, uh, you know, the next chapter in that story that we started with the full measure film. But, but really the thing that was special about that film is that it tells a story and I, and that's what I've told these guys. And we're, you know, we're just not going to go out there and make a story about hunting. Right. This one's going to be about, what a cool place Idaho is, it but is also unbelievable. We drove through yeah. it yesterday. You know, you're spending eight and a half hours in a truck driving through windy roads up over pass. And then you open up in this beautiful, beautiful, you know, um, I guess for lack of better terms, Valley, if it's bigger than that, but a yeah. huge Valley of chalice or wherever. And then you go through another pass and you open up into another one. It's just, yeah, yeah. it is Idaho, uh, we had this conversation yesterday. Idaho is a very unique place in the lower 48. It is like Alaska and down here. And it yeah. is very pretty and is very unique, yeah. very mountainous. It is hard to get around. I mean, yeah. to go from Missoula, Montana to Boise, Idaho, is it's, it's, it's eight and a half hours, but it is a journey. Yeah. It is a true yeah. journey. Yeah, yeah. Now we know why you have more airfields than any other state. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. And, and, and our thing this fall, there'll be flying involved in it too. So I mean, it'll be fun. Yeah, so that one's, a, I'm definitely looking forward to that. And, and uh, yeah, and the rest is just kind of, you know, springs in the air and kind of sniffing the air. These guys are all going to be out bear hunting. I'm going to, yep. I'm tomorrow morning going to head back to the ranch and I still have skis on the Super Cub. So I'm going to land in the field up there. Hopefully there's still snow <laughs> <laughs> and uh, open that place up, which is always a fun thing to, you know, arrive after winter of it's being dormant yeah, and uh, see what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, you know, that I, I still have that spark of adventure flickering in me and I'm like, okay, I'll go light that up tomorrow and go see what's out there. So yeah, it's fun. Very cool. 
Yeah. Well, once again, I appreciate you coming on. Thanks, brother. And telling your story. And I, it's it's always fun. I Every yeah. time, I've heard a lot of these stories, but the, every time I've heard new ones that I didn't know. Yeah. So, yeah. No, which is fun. amazing. Tells you how, how epic your life has been. It's been good. And a heck of a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Imperfect one, but a heck of a ride. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thanks, thanks Glenn. Time. Appreciate it. Hey folks, thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You got to hang out with some of the people that I think are most the most interesting I've ever met. And remember, fair chase is the only way to hunt and take trophy big game. See you next time right here on Eastman's Podcast Edition.